Can you hear my voice? Okay, so I know other people are joining. It's lunchtime. I can understand. <laughs> so, so first of all, apologies if uh, this is in English. Uh, I speak Spanish as well, but in the last years, I have to switch my, for family and business purposes, uh, between uh, Italian, Russian, and English. So that's will be tricky. Si quieres hablar de tontería, es bien, but no de cosas técnicas. Okay, so let's go back to the the topic. So uh, just a couple of words about me. I'm currently based in Ireland and Dublin. I joined last February MSD, which is one of the top five biotech pharmaceutical companies in the world. Uh, if someone in the audience is coming from North America probably knows the company as Merck. And uh, I'm part of MMDIT. Uh, MMDIT stands for uh, Merck Manufacturing Division Information Technology. So what I'm trying to do is uh, helping the company in the data and digital journey, in particular uh, identifying use cases of deep learning and machine learning in the manufacturing space, not restricted to this. We have other use cases in the supply chain and the business process uh, as well. Uh, there is a pizza there in the slides because I like uh, cooking and also heating. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to ask me some tips about how to prepare pizza, uh, you're welcome. And a few numbers about the company in Ireland uh, is present in the country since more than 50 years now with uh, five sites in four different locations. We have two in Dublin. I'm in, uh, located in Dublin North, but really my role is uh, more at the EMEA level. So I'm uh, dealing with projects also in, uh, at the moment in Switzerland and uh, other uh, countries. And, um, uh, if you want to get more information, there is a, you can go to the website. And a couple of words about the Dublin Tech Hub, which is one of the uh, most important tech hubs in uh, Europe at the moment. I know that some politicians, in particular from the country I come from, from Italy, uh, sometimes refer to Ireland such as a, a fiscal heaven, uh, which isn't true because the government uh, gives a lot of uh, um, um, facilitation as a company. Uh, whatever the size of the company, if it's a big company, a startup, a medium-sized company, but uh, everything is regulated. So you have to create jobs, you have to do research development. So a lot of stuff is coming, and in particular in IT, data science, life sciences, uh, uh, financial banking. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's really a challenging and interesting place to work uh, with. Uh, the core topic today is about uh, how uh, to do uh, distributed deep learning uh, using some of the most popular uh, framework for Python, but then doing the training on uh, uh, Apache Spark, which runs on the JVM. So it's a totally uh, different environment. So you have to deal with uh, different things, problems that I'm going to do, and also to explain why sometimes you have to do this and uh, a solution that uh, worked for us in the last uh, past three years. So the, I'm pretty sure that uh, you already know what deep learning is. So just in, put a couple of slides in, uh, uh, to explain in uh, layman's terms what is. It's a specialization of machine learning, where basically you use uh, um, deep neural networks. So a neural network typically has uh, an input layer, an output layer, and uh, different combinations of uh, uh, inner layer called uh, hidden. Uh, the combination defines the particular uh, class of problems, nonlinear problems, you want to, uh, to solve. Uh, the process of uh, uh, the life cycle of uh, deep learning is similar to machine learning. You have to prepare your data, your uh, training and testing uh, data, uh, start training your uh, algorithm and, uh, and validating as well. When you're happy with the, with the performances, you move this to production, start to do inference with new data, and go back if you're not happy or you want to uh, spot some sp uh, space for improvement. So as I mentioned, there are different flavors of of uh, uh, neural networks, depending on the specific problem you want to solve. For example, here you can see uh, uh, you typically use uh, LSTMs in uh, all those cases which involve time. Like, for example, if you want to do forecasting on time series, you use uh, CNN uh, traditionally on uh, uh, whatever is related to object recognition uh, or, or object classification and so on. Um, in terms of uh, the programming languages to do deep learning, uh, of course, data scientists prefer uh, mostly Python uh, for a reason, uh, for more reasons, because it's easy to learn. Uh, there is plenty of availability of libraries and framework for uh, uh, everything, including deep learning. Uh, in the chart on the left here, you can see uh, these are the, the stats coming from, coming from uh, Kate Nuggets about the power scores of for uh, framework, Python frameworks for deep learning across 
2018. As you can see, there is uh, TensorFlow and Keras are the uh, top two. And uh, looking at the data of uh, uh, 2019, these are the data for the first six months. It's the same up to the end of uh, September anyway. There is uh, TensorFlow still on the top. And uh, you can see that PyTorch is gaining uh, position is, uh, in the second place uh, because there is now much more uh, engagement of Facebook on trying to build a greater community of PyTorch. Uh, if PyTorch is ready to production, it's still to uh, be uh, verified because uh, TensorFlow is uh, in the market since a long time. It's more stable, and uh, there are plenty of use cases in the real world. Uh, the fact that Keras is, uh, is in, uh, in the third place uh, doesn't mean that uh, it's because uh, it's um, uh, becoming less popular. It's, it's, uh, the main reason to me is that Keras is merging to TensorFlow. So uh, there is the availability of, the, of Keras as a high-level API in TensorFlow. So that's why uh, you can see PyTorch in the second place to me in, uh, for uh, 2019. Um, just a quick poll, how many people uh, know what TensorFlow is or use TensorFlow? <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> and uh, how many people use uh, Keras or oh, Keras has a high level API for TensorFlow? Okay, so just a good number. So TensorFlow, you know, is open source, has been uh, released by uh, Google. There is a huge community behind this framework, uh, so it's very popular. It's much more an end-to-end -end framework. It's not just for machine learning or deep learning. You have everything from data preparation to then putting things to production, monitoring, and so on. Uh, probably one uh, weakness point of TensorFlow is that uh, the low-level API are uh, really hard to assimilate. So people starting with this framework for the first time could find really difficult uh, to become expert. Uh, so that's why they moved uh, the idea of the authors of Keras to provide something this is specific for deep learning, but with a very high level API. Uh, so the entry point to the framework uh, uh, should be smoother, and people just start to focus on their specific models and specific problems. And of course, both allow the execution of code uh, on top of uh, CPUs or uh, GPUs. And uh, Keras runs on top of uh, different backends, including TensorFlow. In my experience, I had use cases of Keras uh, running on top of uh, a TensorFlow backend. I never did something with different uh, backends, so I can do a comparison of performances doing this. And this is the original architecture, high-level architecture of uh, TensorFlow up to release 1.13. So you can see there is a distributed execution engine, uh, different levels of APIs. At low level, there are the real uh, TensorFlow APIs. Uh, probably you're wondering why Python in this chart is in orange and other languages are in black. Because Python so far is the only one um, la programming languages uh, supported by the uh, stability guarantee uh, from Google. If you try to do some things for in Java, for example, or of Go, uh, if you want to move things to production, be careful because you could have some problems. So I would uh, not encourage people to use those API, do things in, in Python. And uh, then you have other levels of uh, API. And uh, starting from TensorFlow 1.14 and more with TensorFlow 2.0, as you can see, there is Keras is there. It's part of the framework itself. So you can use Keras as a TensorFlow high-level API and then use whatever is behind. So it means that it's an easier entry point for people starting with uh, this framework. Um, today, I'm going to talk on how to distribute, uh, to do distributed deep learning for these two frameworks. Uh, because with the solution I'm going to introduce, there is no support for uh, Python torch yet. Don't know in the future if this will be introduced. So um, uh, another quick poll, how many people uh, use Apache Spark in uh, their projects? Okay, so how many people at least know uh, what Apache Spark is? Okay, there is a good number. So anyway, put this slide is a distributed um, an, uh, engine for unified analytics that run on top of, um, it could be also a community, a, a commodity uh, cluster, and it's pretty fast because by default uh, processes things in memory across all of the nodes of the cluster, and uh, it has support for different languages, including Python, uh, Java, Scala, and uh, there are different ways you can uh, uh, deploy Spark, so probably you could run things on top of something in the cloud, uh, on Databricks, on Azure, on EMR, in Amazon, or you could have your on-prem uh, installation of uh, Spark uh, using Kubernetes or um, uh, Yarn, or probably Apache Mesos, that uh, probably is the worst way to uh, deploy a Spark cluster. 
And um, what are the use cases when you really need to uh, train your models on top of something like Apache Spark, so in a distributed fashion? There are use cases, typically, uh, when your uh, network model is, uh, uh, is big, so uh, you can't uh, um, pretend to achieve results on training these models in a single machine, having is that, that machine has uh, lots of uh, GPUs, or when you have huge data set, just to... Um, put some reference and work with some use cases in uh, fraud, waste, and abuse for a big healthcare provider in the United States. And uh, it, this company uh, uses to process a trillion claims per year. And uh, when you have to deal, uh, try to do machine learning and deep learning on uh, to spot potential sign of fraud, waste, and abuse, you have to cream this data with the provider's data, um, the uh, uh, customer's data, some gov ag government agency's data, and other data uh, from other third-party providers, so you can imagine with this data set, uh, you can do training on a, a single machine uh, on a, a few GPUs, so you have to do something on top of Spark. Uh, scarcity of GPUs, this was a problem up to last year because there was some sort of uh, bad mindset uh, when you have to ask for a budget for a project to buy CPU, GPUs, if there was no data science name in your team, even if it was Fraud Western abuse doing data science there. Uh, the business say, why you need this money for uh, GPUs? You have different servers with uh, CPUs, why you need this? Now things are changing, but anyway, uh, if you have availability of uh, clusters on machine, uh, there's a chance it's better to deploy um, Spark there or use some uh, cloud distributions that such as that Databricks. Um, there's a spoiler here about the next slide. So in the uh, solution I'm going to propose today, I'm going to talk on distributed uh, these models on Apache Spark, but the same works also if you want to do things in parallel on a single machine with multiple GPUs. So you use the same code. What is different is that you use a different training master, which is a, a specific class co uh, called a Parallel Wrapper. Uh, so um, in case you have enough GPUs, you can still use this tech stack that I'm going to present. Um, challenges on doing this. There are technical challenges, you can see in this slide. So first of all is that uh, the execution model of Spark is different from uh, uh, the execution model of most part of the available frameworks for deep learning, in particular for those uh, implemented in Python. Uh, so it means that in Spark, you know, you have stages. Each, for each stage, you have a given number of tasks that run in parallel. If some of these tasks go, goes down, it's up to Spark to try to restore it. And anyway, this doesn't affect uh, what the other tasks are doing. Uh, this model is good, but it's bad for training uh, uh, neural networks. Because if a task goes down, even if Spark restores it, you have to start uh, the training from scratch. And uh, so this means that you have to spend more time, more money, and delivering results um, with uh, significant delay for your uh, customers. Uh, GPU configuration uh, and management could be sometimes a nightmare because uh, the deep learning framework allows you to run the code on top of GPUs, but then when you have your ma to manage the infrastructure, you have very uh, few utilities to do this, and this could be really challenging. And last but not least, you have to pick up one between performance and accuracy, because if you run things with uh, Spark, just using the Spark API, Spark components, and running on top of the JVM only with uh, such as traditional uh, Java scale applications, uh, if you want to achieve the best of performances, you have to sacrifice something in terms of accuracy, uh, because uh, uh, the JVM has to do some rounding, some approximation, that at the end will affect the accuracy of your model. Vice versa. If you prefer to achieve the, the best accuracy, you have to sacrifice something in performance. So it means that your training could last also days. Uh, probably it's not the case. You could do this. Not only technical challenges on doing this, uh, there are other uh, challenges. In my career, I've been in a position of managing teams of software engineers and uh, data scientists. Um, these two groups have uh, different uh, skills, a different mindset, uh, while software engineers uh, think much more about scalability, performance, putting things uh, uh, that work in production. The data scientists often have some uh, mindset more oriented to the research. So they say, OK, I did this model, this is a fancy model, I checked that this accuracy is 98%. Yes, but then we have to move this to 
production using the real data and uh, run this in parallel on a different environments and then you have to rewrite everything from scratch. Uh, some companies tried in the past to create some unicorns, but uh, this doesn't work. So uh, I believe that uh, data scientists should be data scientists with a little flavor of uh, understanding something in, in the DevOps space and software engineers should be software engineers with a little understanding of the data science world and try to find something in your infrastructure that could be some sort of uh, common layer, common language between the two teams. And uh, this is how we solve this problem. Uh, we started this in 2017. Now you have probably more options, but this is something that uh, still works uh, today. Uh, Deep Learning 4J uh, is an open source framework that we introduce in our tech stack. It's an open source framework for uh, doing uh, deep learning on top of the JVM. So it's specific for uh, JVM programming languages, such as Java, Scala, Kotlin, you name it. And um, the, of course, since the first release is natively integrated with Hadoop and Apache Spark, so you need, it means that you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you need to do things with Hadoop and Spark. It doesn't mean that you have to mandatory use Hadoop. I uh, have used cases of the, with the data in uh, Amazon S3, for example, or you don't have to mandatory use Apache Spark. If you want to do this, uh, you have very high level APIs, so the entry point is good. And, uh, but if you run things on a machine with multiple GPUs, you can still use uh, the same framework. And uh, as I mentioned, the same code can run on uh, CPUs, GPUs, or a mixed environment without changing your code. So you have just to change the configuration of your application and add the specific dependency <laughs> Uh, for uh, CPUs or uh, GPUs. Uh, this is how uh, this works. Uh, basically, uh, you have data scientists working in Python uh, with their uh, um, framework of uh, choice. In this case, in this example, is Keras. It was the first one supported by uh, Deep Learning 4J with uh, any flavor of backend, so they could use uh, any other Python libraries. If they want to use Pandas, NumPy, whatever, uh, it's fine. All of the best practices they know in, uh, in Python or implementing models still apply. Uh, what is different is that at the end, when they are happy with the result, they need to export the model in a serialized mode and commit this, uh, put this under version control. And then this is important into uh, deep learning for J. We see in a few minutes how this happens and, uh, uh, programmatically. Uh, it, it means that uh, from now uh, and downstream, everything happens into uh, an environment which is uh, uh, mostly based on things that run on the JVM. So there is it's a chance that in production you have Spark, Hadoop, Elasticsearch, Solar, Stream Set Data Collector, Kafka, whatever, all things implemented in Scala or Java at the run on JVM. So your, uh, if you have a major continuous delivery pipeline on, doing, on um, building, testing, and delivering things, uh, you can uh, still keep it and just having the uh, pre trained Python models or do transfer learning on top of your JVM infrastructure with minimal impact and a lot of automation you can put on top of this. Um, Deep Learning 4J provides later support also for TensorFlow models on a combination of the two. So if you use TensorFlow, uh, the Keras API on top of uh, TensorFlow. Um, another uh, couple of notes before entering the first example. Uh, Deep Learning 4J is a modular framework, so you don't need to import all of the modules. There are many in your project, just those uh, that you really need. I'm not going through details for this in the interest of time. Just I want to put the uh, accent on the ND4J. And the 4J was born as a um, component from, for Deep Learning 4J, but now it's some sort of also a standalone project. It's a library which, is, which core has been implemented in C++ or CUDA, depending if you want to use it on uh, CPUs or GPUs, but exposes the APIs in Scala, so you can use it also in a, in a Java project. And uh, this means basically this library has been created to fill the gap between Python and the JVM programming languages in terms of availability for those uh, uh, in terms of uh, tools, libraries for uh, linear algebra or magic manipulations. Uh, and uh, this is pretty fast. The syntax is very close to the one for NumPy. If you are uh, familiar with NumPy, you can start using uh, ND4J in Scala or Java without problems. And um, so we have uh, three uh, different uh, technologies uh, that put together are a powerful combination. Uh, each one brings something to, this, uh, to the plate. The first one is Deep Learning 4J, which has a very high level API. So this is uh, the perfect entry point for software engineers uh, to understand things of uh, deep learning and focusing on their particular problem and not only 
anything about the math behind uh, the data science. Uh, then you have Apache Spark, you know, in terms of performances for uh, distributed calculation is uh, the best uh, uh, if you do things uh, both in batch of streaming fashion. But when it comes to training uh, multi-layer neural networks, there is a problem I mentioned before about picking up one between performance and accuracy. And uh, this could be solved if you have something that doesn't run only on the JVM, but uh, at low level, very close to your hardware. And this happens in deep learning for j through ND4J, because implicitly or explicitly, it always uses ND4J, which, is, uh, which core is implemented in C++ or CUDA. So most part of the things happen uh, very close to your uh, processor and your hardware uh, in your infrastructure. That's why this is a powerful uh, combination. And uh, this is how the process happens. Um, uh, as you can see, the flow is uh, pretty similar if you're using Keras or TensorFlow. Uh, so the uh, data scientists uh, implement and train uh, their models using their uh, framework of choice uh, in Keras or TensorFlow. Uh, then they, when they're happy, they save uh, their uh, serialized model in uh, the specific format for that framework. Uh, what is different uh, is uh, on the Java side. Uh, so that's why you see different icons, uh, uh, Python and Java in this chart, is the class that you have to use uh, for, to import the model. It's Keras model import for Keras and TEF graph mapper for uh, TensorFlow. And then the rest of the flow is, this, is similar for both. You use the same API, the same classes, and then you load new data, preprocess them if needed, and start to do inference. If you're not happy with the result on the, when you run these things on your uh, Java Scala side, you can still do transfer learning over there and modify the model as well. And, uh, uh, we'll see now an example for uh, Keras. Um, just for people familiar with Keras, I uh, want to put this slide to say that uh, these are the typical um, um, uh, elements of, uh, uh, of the Keras framework, uh, the different categories. Uh, at the present time, uh, the current implementation of Deep Learning 4J covers about 95% of this uh, concept. So, uh, uh, so far, I never encountered a case where uh, uh, my team had to go back to the design and say, oh, you have, probably you have to uh, change something because this is not supported by Deep Learning 4J. So it's very comprehensive. Uh, and uh, and uh, anyway, uh, the remaining 5% is going to be covered in the next month by the uh, framework maintainers uh, that at the moment is, uh, Deep Learning 4J is maintained by the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, so this is how the, it happens in, uh, with the code, as a code example. Uh, you, in this case, uh, to make thim things simple, I'm importing one of the models available in the Keras Zoo. It's a VGG16 model. Uh, it's a convolutional neural network. And uh, I'm um, uh, importing the weights of the ImageNet network. Uh, then, in the um, code below, I tested that everything is uh, working fine. When I'm uh, happy with this, the, the same you do if you train you the model yourself in Python. Then I have to uh, save the serialized model. In this example, I split the configuration of the model and the weights on two different files. Uh, but uh, uh, you know that in Keras, you can put together in a single file. Um, anyway, whatever your choice is, uh, Deep Learning 4J supports both. So uh, I have a JSON file for the configuration of the model and uh, a H uh, five, uh, F5 file for the weights. And then I put this under uh, version control, and then on the uh, software engineering side, uh, there is a, an application, in this case it's in Scala, but it's the same with uh, Java, pretty same. You import uh, the model configuration and the weights, and then use the Keras import, uh, model import class to import this model uh, into your application. The third argument for this method, uh, which is set to false, it means that if it's false, uh, in case you do transfer learning, uh, uh, the process uh, shouldn't change the original weights of the model. Uh, if you put this to true, it means that if I do transfer learning, I want to then release a punta under version control a new model with uh, uh, updated uh, weights, but doing this on the Java front or Scala front. And uh, then I load uh, other images, because this is an example for image classification, uh, transform them in a multidimensional array, because the model expects this, and start to do inference, in this case using the output uh, method. And, and then you can also decode uh, the output of your uh, uh, prediction to make uh, it in a more human-readable uh, format. For some of these uh, pre-trained models, uh, also for the models that are part of the Deep Learning for J Zoo, there are uh, 
facilities or utilities to uh, automatically decode the result. Otherwise, you have to write your uh, few lines of code uh, to show the result to the, um, your final users. I then uh, finish this, uh, this process. I can save uh, the, ser the serialized model from Deep Learning 4J in a specific format in a zip file. And then this file could be distributed across multiple uh, Java or Scala application or Kotlin or whatever language you use. And in this example that has been taken from my book, basically I created a very stupid uh, micro web application that uses that model. I use a framework called Spark Java to implement microservices and micro, uh, micro web application, but you can use any other uh, framework available for uh, the JVM languages. I pick up an image from uh, the web, that's not my car, and uh, I uploaded <laughs> the image to this uh, fancy UI. <laughs> so I'm not a, uh, a web developer. And uh, then the, mm, the system is telling me that uh, for it, uh, almost 77%, this is a sport car and other uh, potential results uh, that are meaningful for the, the particular image that has been uploaded. If you're not happy anyway, say, okay, 77% is not a good result to me, so I would need probably to um, pick up and prepare another data set and retrain the model, and, uh, but if you pick up probably a huge data set and want to do things in Spark, you go back to your Java code, and I'm skipping for a moment these two slides, and uh, basically there are very few classes you have to be familiar with if you want to uh, do the training on Spark in Deep Learning 4J. The first one is the training master, so this is basically basically the implementation you're going to use uh, of the, um, let's say, the component that will uh, do the training, distribute the training for you on top of an existing Apache uh, Spark cluster. And there are at the moment two different implementations uh, for, uh, for this. Going back to this slide, uh, this is what happens behind the scene is the parameter averaging and the asynchronous uh, stochastic descent gradient. Uh, the good news is that you don't have to know what uh, was happening uh, at low level here uh, because uh, uh, the high level API uh, allows you just to use the deep learning for JPI and forget about these details. So if you are curious enough and you want to understand what's going on uh, in your training, you can go back, uh, but uh, anyway, you can demand this activity probably to the guys that maintain the infrastructure to uh, uh, pull metrics uh, to understand the performances of your application. Uh, then, um, after the training master, uh, there are two classes available for, uh, to represent your model in a distributed environment, as the Spark DL4J multilayer and Spark Computation Graph, which are wrappers of the multilayer network and the Computation Graph classes for, uh, from the same framework. Whatever is your network implementation, you will uh, always use one of those two classes. So if you're doing something with a particular CNN, is an a image net or a specific uh, a custom uh, CNN, or is a LSTM or some other uh, neural network, you always use those classes. So this is a very, very powerful high-level framework because you don't have to reinvent the wheel and use a specific class and understand which one to use for uh, your uh, custom model. Um, the last class that uh, you have to consider are the RDD of dataset and multi-dataset. Uh, by the way, for people familiar with Spark, Dataset here is not the dataset from the Apache Spark API. It's uh, the dataset uh, interface uh, for data structures for, uh, from uh, ND4J. That's why whatever you do, you're going to use uh, implicitly or explicitly RDD or dataset or multi-dataset. And because this is implemented in ND4J, uh, it means that this is running in C++ or CUDA and very close to the hardware of your node. That's why uh, this becomes uh, very, very powerful. Um, so probably someone is... Uh, uh, asking yourself why RDD are not data frame. I saw some faces. <laughs> so the, if you think of the deep learning, uh, deep learning is uh, done to address some um, non-linear problem. So there is a chance that you're dealing with unstructured data. Could be images, videos, audios, or some other unstructured data coming from uh, medical devices, for example. Uh, so in order to pre-process this data, you don't need, uh, in the final format, a, a tabular representation. At the end, you need tensors. So data frames in Spark uh, comes with an extra structure on top of RDDs, uh, specific to put data in tabular format, which will make the performance performance is really bad for if you do this in deep learning, but typically uh, you won't need it. Uh, the, the, don't remember if they put support for them, but uh, in other Spark applications, that's true. Uh, I suggest not use RDD, use that frames. <laughs> but in this case, this is optimized because uh, the, with RDD, you're running things uh, very close to your, your GPUs or, or CPUs. 
That's, uh, that's the reason. And uh, in order to retrain the model, basically going back to your code, uh, if you see there is a, I'm getting the configuration that has been imported into the uh, Scala object, and uh, set up the Spark context and configuration, and then uh, in this case I'm uh, using a parameter averaging training master to train these things. Then I create an instance of uh, the network uh, for Spark uh, using the Spark context, the model configuration imported from Python, and um, uh, the, the, the training master, and then start to do training and evaluation with the uh, deep learning for JPI. In this case, I cut the code because it was a little bit longer, but anyway, there are specific fit methods for uh, your data. In this case, the training data are uh, images. I skipped also the part for uh, pre-processing them because that requires another uh, 20 minutes <laughs> of talk just for uh, for that topic uh, and this is the this process is uh, repeatable so it means whatever is your problem you're writing the same code so at the end uh, we ended up into creating some templates uh, and uh, having this as part of our automated uh, process anytime there was a new commit of uh, a new model in our uh, github enterprise uh, they were um, automatically updated to these classes or created a new uh, application for uh, that specific problems and uh, different templates um, depending also on uh, different um, uh, training data, if there are images or uh, uh, other type of images. Uh, anyway, uh, the support is in uh, Deep Learning for J, so the DataVec module uh, allows you to transform everything into tensors, whatever the input is. If there are images, documents, we have also to process a lot of PDF, for example, so if binary contents, you can still use DataVec and then do the same things uh, with the same API. Uh, Deep Learning for J comes also with some uh, visual facilities. This is an example of one of the, uh, is the entry point of the UI you have when you train your models. There are lots of pages with a lot of charts, really useful uh, also for data scientists to understand how the train, uh, training is going. So if you spot something that to you is not as expected, you could still stop the training, fix things, could be in configuration or somewhere else, and uh, uh, do the training uh, again. So in this case, you will save time because this information uh, comes in real time. And um, among the pages available in, the, in this application, there is also possibility to check for the resource usages. Um, I took this snapshot where you can see uh, for uh, this is a local Spark cluster in a single for a single node uh, running on a CPU. Uh, you can see on the chart on the top uh, there is uh, there are two graphs. The, there is a um, red line which is. Uh, pretty much constant in time, which represent the uh, utilization of uh, JVM memory during this training, while the blue line represents the utilization of uh, and off it memory uh, for the same training in the same interval. As you can see, this is going up and down. Uh, this is a case where the training is, go is going very well, uh, but I deliberately put uh, a bad memory workspace configuration so that you can see the uh, fluctuation of utilization of uh, off it memory. Why this happens? If you recall that uh, the implementation of MD4J, you know that uh, this has been implemented in C++ and Qt, but runs on the JVM. So most part of your object, you have to expect to have them in the off it memory. So this is the main difference on uh, implementing the Spark application for this training uh, compared to traditional Spark or JavaScript application. So you have to pay a little more uh, attention on this, but the rest of uh, the practice, the best practice you have in uh, uh, coding or a monitoring application are still valid. So this is uh, uh, the only thing which is really new, uh, which is a little bit more unusual for a Java Scala um, developer. Uh, and uh, uh, this will require another hour or a couple of hours to talk about it. But uh, just this is good ent entry point. If you start doing things this way, take care of the off it memory. And in some cases, uh, basically, you can also reduce uh, the um, amount of uh, memory reserved for, uh, uh, the, um, um, for the heap memory and uh, use much more for the off it. So that's a good strategy to start with. I um, collected all of this information. I know there is a, probably we have a lot of questions and uh, other uh, curiosities. I collected this in, uh, in my book, which is uh, going very well on uh, Torrent as well. So people have downloaded this. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's, uh, it's a good uh, recognition. So oh, people like the book, <laughs> and it's uh, it's been uh, ranked in the top seven uh, uh, Apache Spark books for uh, 2019. Uh, is uh, I sur was surprised because uh, 
is at uh, fourth place, and sixth place there is one by Matei, Matei Zakaria, which is the guy with uh, uh, Creative Spark. So I don't know <laughs> why people <laughs> are putting more, uh, more uh, faith in my book. Uh, that, uh, that's good. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, I forgot to add here a link to my GitHub uh, repository. There are uh, a couple of examples. One is uh, a training with a different kind of network. So there is a, a, a Python example in Keras I found on GitHub, and then I adapted a little bit and then implemented the um, Java code uh, to do the same. Uh, uh, it's a case of uh, LSTM. And uh, then there is an example on how to import a TensorFlow model uh, that should work also with TensorFlow 2.0, uh, some sort of wrapper uh, that I implemented to working with the uh, streams guys to add an extra component on uh, the streams data collector. But uh, you can play uh, with it and uh, importing in your, uh, in your application and see how it works with your specific model in, um, in uh, running then on the JVM. So this is uh, uh, all I have for uh, you today. And uh, I'm open for questions. Feel free to contact me here around. I'll be around up to 5.30 PM or 6. Uh, feel free to join me in LinkedIn or Twitter through my blog. And um, uh, I, I would like to have also feedback from people. I did a similar talk one month and a half in Moscow, and I'm receiving a lot of feedback and uh, people that asking for uh, also some help, support on how to do things this way, or that had other uh, problems using different frameworks or different things. So I'm, I'm trying to collect all these use cases, and as soon as we'll be done with the traveling, with conferences and my job, I, I will put all these things in my blog uh, across 2020. So. Let's stay tuned and uh, also understand the evolution uh, or alternatives to do this. Because in 2017, this was the only uh, viable solution. Uh, also at the CERN in Geneva, they came up with a similar solution. Uh, but now there are new frameworks and technologies uh, coming up. In particular, if you have availability of uh, GPUs, there, is, there, are, there will be some uh, valid alternatives. Uh, thank you again. Uh, muchas gracias for coming. <laughs> So any questions? Ah, there are a couple of people there. <laughs> yes. So this lights are blinding, so I hope I can see your face as well. <laughs> I, uh, in, in my company, we a year ago, we were debating about using uh, Deep Learning for j Yes. Yeah. Uh, but we also thought about Big DL uh, yeah. ah, from yeah. Intel. Do you know? Uh, do you have yeah. you know, an opinion about that? Yeah, I forgot to mention that when we started this in 2017, the, the comparison between three different uh, frameworks for deep learning for uh, Scala, uh, deep learning for J, uh, big DL from Intel, another one from ThoughtWorks, which name was uh, a Scala uh, DL or something similar, and uh, we ended up with this one because the big DL is uh, uh, is good in performances if you have Intel hardware. If you switch to other uh, hardware, which was our case, it was really bad. And another reason was that um, in terms of importing the Python models, uh, it's a little bit tricky. So in this case, basically, you have uh, the uh, data scientists using uh, their libraries of choice, and then just uh, version uh, the serialized model. While there, they have to learn about big DL. In this case, they forget about deep learning for j And the other one we discarded from ThoughtWorks was, uh, was pretty new, not yet ready to production, and also uh, implemented by data scientists for data scientists. This has been born for uh, software engineers. So people that have to put this in production uh, didn't have any clue about uh, gradients, derivatives, or whatever uh, metrics is behind <laughs> this. Uh, thank you for an interesting yeah. uh, presentation. Thank you. How uh, can deep learning for j be uh, affected or improved uh, from Project Hydrogen of Spark? Oh, it's still ongoing, but yeah, this is uh, probably uh, when uh, Spark 3.0 uh, will come up to light. So there is at the moment no deadline. I talk with Holden Carao, with Tom Graves. They don't know yet. <laughs> uh, that probably would be the case that uh, some of these things could become uh, obsolete. Uh, one thing that probably will be still valid is about the, the import of the Python models. So probably the Deep Learning for j API themselves, if you want to do everything from scratch in Java Scala, uh, in time uh, could be something that could be discarded. I also talked with uh, Holden Carao on a possibility of uh, uh, importing this API in Spark after uh, the in Spark 3.0. Don't know, know how this is the conversation, but 
that's a good point. So this so is. So it would be uh, merged in Spark then. Uh? Yeah, he did this proposal, uh, but I don't know. But anyway, with uh, we're waiting. The problem is at the moment there is no deadline for Spark 3.0. Uh, I know also what has been implemented there, uh, but uh, no one knows. So uh, if you have something in production now, or have to do this in the last three years, <laughs> there is no uh, valid alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Other question? No. Okay. No. Uh, running out of time, so <laughs> thank you. But feel free to reach me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.